Welcome to another episode of the Lyceum of History, comparing Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. Let's look at the historical background for Greece. The Golden Age of Athens had ended with a Spartan victory in the Peloponnesian War. And Macedon, under the leadership of Philip II, had risen to power. And finally, when they were able to defeat Athens and Thebes in 338 BC, Macedon became the dominant power in mainland Greece. And with the unexpected assassination of Philip II, Alexander took the throne at the age of 23. Now the Roman background. The Marian reforms in the late 2nd century BC forever changed the Roman army. Marian was able to give and promise soldiers land back in their homeland of Italy upon completion of service in the military. And what this did is this transformed the Roman army of citizen soldiers to a professional army, loyal to the general rather than to Rome itself. And at the same time, the aristocratic Roman Senate was increasingly seen as corrupt and out of touch with the common people of Rome, the people of the Republic. The rise to power was slightly different. Alexander's father was King Philip of Macedon, and upon his death, he ascended to the throne. Alexander was also tutored by Aristotle, the famed philosopher who had studied himself under Plato. And he became king at a very young age. And you can see a statue of Alexander's father, as well as his tutor, Aristotle, and a statue of Caesar. Now, Caesar was born into a patrician or wealthy family of Rome in 100 BC. Caesar began his political career in the army. It was his conquests that made him wealthy, although he did hold several political posts. Now, let's look at these men's military achievements. Alexander in the Battle of Granicus in 334 BC was able to deliver a bold attack that led to a quick defeat of the Persians. And the Macedonian phalanx, invented by his father, was key to victory. The phalanx was a formation where rows of men would be lined up in their armor and they would have an 18-foot sphere that they would basically use as a running uh, pincushion with the cavalry supporting them on either side. At the Battle of Isis in 333 BC, Alexander and King Darius III actually fought in single-hand-to-hand combat, and Darius III fled, leaving his family behind. He offered his empire west of the Euphrates. According to legend, Alexander asked Promethean, what would you do? He said he would agree to the, the deal, and Alexander replied, I would too, if I were Parmenian, and he crumbled up the tree and sent it back. A year later, during the Siege of Tyre, a Phoenician city-state who refused to surrender, the island was actually part of the city that was a kilometer off the mainland, and Tyre had resisted Alexander for seven months. And keep in mind that many other empires, the Babylonians and Syrians, had tried to do the same thing, besieged the city. None were successful. Alexander built a causeway to connect the mainland to the island city. He was able to conquer the city. An estimated 30,000 people were sold in slavery. Whoever wasn't killed was sold in slavery. And this sent a message down the coast. A man who had still never lost a battle was able to take down a city-state that had until then been invincible. And of course you can see a map of his route of conquest as well as what Tyre looked like both as a map and the actual modern coastline. In the same year, he marched into Egypt and was proclaimed Pharaoh and welcomed as a liberator. Within Egypt, he founded his most famous of his many Alexandrias, cities that were to be modeled after the Greek style, but founded throughout his empire. It was this Alexandria in Egypt that was to be his most enduring, and it's still one of the largest cities in Egypt today. And what the city did was it opened up the Nile Valley to the Mediterranean Sea, which increased trade tremendously, both in goods and ideas. The following year, the Battle of Gorgamala was the last stand of Persian King Darius. It was really the end of any real Persian resistance. And during the battle, Darius was seen fleeing again, and this time was murdered by one of the satraps, or governors. In 330 BC, the Macedonian army captured Persepolis, the ceremonial capital of the Persian Empire. And in revenge for former Persian king Xerxes' invasion of Greece a century earlier and his burning of Athens, Alexander's men looted and then burnt the city to the ground. They were able to gain enormous wealth, taking 
tens of thousands of talents. At the Battle of Xerxes, 329 BC, fought near the Syria Darya River, a major river in Central Asia, against Sogdian and Scythian forces. And you can see on the map where the battle took place, as well as the scenery, what it looks like today. But what made this battle amazing was the siege of the Sogdian Rock. When Alexander was told that he would need men with wings to capture it, Alexander had the river diverted, undermining the foundations and thereby taking the city ending resistance in Central Asia. At his final major battle, the Didastic River in 326 BC, he fought against King Porus. His army included war elephants. After the battle, he was so impressed, he actually left him in charge of that region. But later, the Seleucid Empire sold this area to gain war elephants for its fights further west. This would give rise to the Mauryan Empire in India. But that's much later. It was at this point that Alexander's troops, grown tired of the monsoon winds, refused to march any further, and Alexander had to return home. You can see in the image of the coin, a victory coin depicting Alexander charging Porus on a war elephant. You can also see on the map where the battle was fought, as well as an image of what if a possible place where the battlefield took place. Alexander left soldiers in every new city he founded and he began to make plans for an invasion of Arabia. But after several nights of celebration in Babylon, he suddenly fell ill with a fever. And as the days passed on, and he grew sicker and sicker, the soldiers asked who he would give the empire to, according to legend, to the strongest. Alexander died on the evening of June 10th or 11th, 323 BC, most likely of typhoid fever, or possibly malaria. Sadly, today, the mortality rate of malaria is 10 to 30 percent, but with prompt treatment, is well over 99 percent. Now let's look at the military achievements of Julius Caesar. He's best known for fighting in the Gallic Wars, of which he wrote about, from 58 to 50 BC. In Gaul, the area that includes modern France, Belgium, Western Germany, Switzerland, etc. At the time, Gaul was made up of many independent Celtic tribes and they were never able to form any true um, unification. During this time, he also led two campaigns of exploration to Britain in 55 and again in 54 BC, as well as across the Rhine into Germania in 55 and 53 BC, the first Roman to do so for both. And it was at the Battle of Alicia in 52 BC, he was able to deliver the decisive blow to any further resistance. This was even after the uh, last attempt of the tribes of Gaul to unite against Caesar and his men. You can see on the map the routes he took throughout Gaul and the fortification in the image to the right. To kind of give you an idea of what it looked like during this time, there's some soldier images as well, reconstructed images. And of course, Gaul would go on to spread the Romance languages that are still spoken today. While his victory in Gaul brought him wealth and prestige, his civil war victory against Pompey was what gave him his ultimate power. What had prompted this was Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus had formed the first triumvirate to share power. Crassus had died in battle, leaving the other two alive. After Gaul, the Senate wished to strip Caesar of his power. Caesar crossed the Rubicon in 49 BC, an act of war. And after Caesar defeated Pompey in the Battle of Pharsalus in 48 BC, Caesar went to Egypt, thereby bringing in that country into the Roman sphere of influence. In his campaign to Egypt in 48 to 47 BC, this is when he supported Cleopatra, who was the last pharaoh. He also went on the Pontic campaign from 47 to 45 BC, an area in modern Turkey. This is where his famous line, Vini Vidi Vici, translates to, I came, I saw, I conquered, was spoken. He was also involved in an African campaign, as well as a Spanish campaign against Pompey forces. Next, let's look at these men's leadership. Alexander was said to lead his troops by example, often leading the front of the charge, sharing in both their hardships and their success. Caesar was beloved by his troops as well. He used his wealth of conquest to enrich those who served under him. He was also well liked by the plebeians or the 
commoners as well. He was seen as someone who stood up to the Senate. Opposition. Alexander encouraged the blending of Greek and Persian cultures. He even married Roxana, a Bactrian princess in 327 BC. There were many that did not like this. Caesar, while well liked by the plebeians and seen as someone who stood for the Senate, the Senate was worried that Caesar was becoming too powerful. They were fearful of the days before the Republic when Rome was ruled by kings. Both men met untimely deaths. Alexander died on June 10th or 11th, 323 BC at the age of 32, and with no plan of succession, his generals fought for control of the empire. Caesar was assassinated by members of the Roman Senate on March 15th, 44 BC. Although the Republic they hoped to save came to an end as Rome plunged into civil war and the Roman Empire emerged in the aftermath. Alexander's legacy was to spread Greek culture and blend it with Egyptian, Persian, Indian art and beliefs. Alexandria, Egypt, mentioned earlier, became a center of Hellenistic learning. And Greek became the lingua franca for the Eastern Mediterranean for nearly a millennia. And you can see in the images to the left the various artistic forms that were blended with various cultures. The Greek style sculpture of the Buddha, the Greek coins found in Bactria, modern day Afghanistan, as well as mosaics in Afghanistan, and a manuscript of the Bible in Coptic from the 5th century AD, hundreds of years after the life of Alexander. Caesar's legacy, his death marked the end of the Roman Republic. He also invented the Julian calendar, which established a 365 day year, with an extra day added every four years to account for the solar year. It's actually still used by the Orthodox Church today. The main difference with that and the Gregorian calendar is the calculation of leap years. The Latin language also spread throughout Western Europe. The leaders after him took his namesake as a title. Caesar, Kaiser, Tsar. And you can see on the map the various Romance languages spoken throughout Europe, as well as the coin depicting his assassination. In summary, both men led expeditions to the edge of their known worlds. They were both military geniuses that expanded Greco-Roman culture. Both of their deaths were premature and led to turmoil. The main difference, Alexander tried to blend the cultures of his empire. Caesar's goal is to gain power and glory. Thank you for watching. Please hit thumbs up and consider subscribing to this channel for more information about the past.